Let me explain to you how becoming a doctor works. First, you have to go through four years of college, studying pre-med science courses, and then you eventually take an aptitude test called the MCAT. Naturally, whatever overpriced orbital fees they're charging for undergraduate education these days, you'll have to pay with no backsies, no discounts, and definitely no refunds. It'll cost between $40,000 on the low end and $120,000 on the high end. Then, if you meet the scholastic requirements, as well as the hidden racial quota, you'll be lucky enough to be given an opportunity for another four years of even more intensive study in medical school. And you'll frequently be averaging about eight hours of class every day, followed by another eight hours of study after class, at an additional cost between $120,000 and $360,000 for the pleasure. And mixed in with your training, you'll have to take intermittent standardized tests, which get more expensive as you go along, but are usually something like $1,000 a pop. If you fail the test, you pay again. If there's a fire in the building and you can't finish the test, or if you fail it because the flames and the firemen freaked you out, too bad. You still have to pay again. So assuming you don't fail and you don't get burned out, you're looking at a minimum of about $5,000 for all these tests that aren't covered by tuition that you have to pay out of pocket even though there aren't enough hours in the day for you to attend school, study, and conceivably hold a job to pay for these tests. At medical school graduation, you'll finally get the MD or DO behind your name after a total of eight years of education, but it won't mean jack because for almost all jobs out there, and to even obtain a medical license to legally practice medicine, you will first need to complete postgraduate training after medical school called residency. In fact, you can't even practice as a physician assistant or a nurse or anything else, even with a medical doctorate without completing this residency. Residency training ranges from three to seven plus years long. So if you're following along with me and doing the math, that means if you started when you were 18 and took absolutely no time off for things like exploring the world or starting a family, you'd be between 29 and 33 when you finally get to practice medicine and get a paycheck. You give up your 20s, your youth, and for women, you give up your fertility to become a doctor. Most women in medicine that I know end up having very few children. They usually struggle to just have one because when they finally have the time to think about having a child and to give that child the love and devotion it requires, their peak fertility has long since passed. They find out too late that their career will eat their children. Now you technically do get paid during residency and the pay of residency is decent, usually around $50,000 a year. That's a lot of money, at least for someone who doesn't have hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. But if you do, and you will if you've been to med school, the loan payments will eat a lot of that up. The interest alone on my debt was more than $30,000 a year. So after I paid the interest, and after I paid taxes, and yes, they still taxed me at the regular rate, I usually had enough money so that my wife and I could eat and pay rent at the same time. And no, the government doesn't allow you to either tax deduct your loan payments or even allow you the courtesy to go bankrupt. Bankruptcy is for big banks and big businesses, not for you. Residency itself is the worst stage of medical training. It's an unholy combination of full-time and overtime work, training on the job, book learning, abrupt responsibility, and totally unrealistic expectations thrown into a hospital to make a hodgepodge of stress, terror, and misery. It's utterly horrible, especially the first year. 13% of residents graduate with post-traumatic stress disorder, and up to 43% have depression at any given time during their training. Somewhat amusingly, I was enrolled in a study examining depression in first-year residents, but I found myself too depressed to fill out any of the questionnaires they needed to complete the study. Consequently, that 43% may be an underestimate. It's so bad that the suicide rate of doctors in general is two to three times higher than the national average. Suicide is the leading cause of death in male residents, and one in 16 surgeons have had suicidal ideations. In New York City, one of the worst places you could possibly do residency, every July when the new residents start their training, it starts raining new residents from the hospital rooftops. 
literally dying is a better option for these medical trainees than being abused in those goddamned hospitals for even one more day. And for those that don't kill themselves by the end of the day, they had better make sure to keep it together, to keep smiling, and for God's sakes, not to break down. Because if you do, or if you honestly state your opinion, or insist on being treated with the dignity of a human being and not a two-legged draft horse, they will come up with some pretext to fire you. And after you're fired from one residency program, it is near impossible to ever find another. That was your one shot, and if you blew it, the only way you'll even have a chance of getting into another training program, assuming waves and waves of foreign medical graduates don't simply outcompete you and take every opportunity, is if the same people that fired you also give you a letter of recommendation. That is not bloody likely. If you get fired, you're likely going to be out on your ass with no realistic job prospects with a mountain of debt that is increasing by $30,000 every year. Residency is so bad that the overworked residents were killing people. For instance, it was not uncommon for surgical residents to fall asleep on their feet while operating. So bad that the government passed a law that limited what they called the duty hours, the number of continuous hours a resident physician could work consecutively. Most residency programs got around this rule by forcing more work into few hours and by encouraging people to lie about their duty hours. They could do this because the system that is due to report duty hours violations is not anonymous. If you report a violation, the first person it goes to is your program director, along with your name, your date of birth, and your picture, just in case you are lucky enough to have been forgotten by them for at least a few minutes. I reported a duty hours violation my first month, and one of my supervisors told me, quote, I never said this, but don't report any more violations, end quote. If you report duty hours violations consistently, you will be fired. They will find something on you, make something up, or make a mountain out of a molehill, and then say that you are recalcitrant and not amenable to improvement. They'll say anything and everything to just get you fired, to punish you for telling the truth and for following the law. And another reason these organizations can do whatever they want to you is that they are immune to antitrust laws. They get to do what they want to you, and if you complain, if you assert your rights, you are gone. You are dead to them. As the Japanese saying goes, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. Residency is mandatory. If you don't get in, you don't become a doctor. You don't work, and that mountain of debt is still your responsibility. And it is extremely difficult to get into residency because you are up against the world. Foreigners from every country in the world are competing to get into American programs. Pay-to-play Saudi Arabians come here, and their government pays big bucks for our training while they take up spots and resources that could otherwise be used for Americans' training. Oil-rich Middle Eastern countries are the worst offenders, but most countries play a role. Canadians frequently come here for training, costing the American taxpayer at least $450,000, and most of them go right back to Canada to practice medicine. That extra cost is never tabulated when the miracle of Canadian socialized medicine is discussed. And then, because U.S. doctors get paid more than anywhere else, foreigners that stay here after training generally stay for the money, even though there aren't even enough spots to accommodate the American citizens who graduate medical school every year. The medical education establishment doesn't care, though, because they aren't the ones with years of their life wasted and a mountain of debt. The foreign applicants lose nothing if they don't get in, but you cannot work, cannot move on, and your debt to heartless banks and even more heartless medical institutions will outlive you. They don't care if you don't get in, they don't care if you don't succeed. If someone gets fired, they don't even need to replace them because it isn't more work for them. It's just more work for you, the other yet-to-be-fired resident physicians. Resident physicians are just cheap labor for hospitals and programs to increase their bottom line. Residency is hellacious, and it is mandatory for every physician to go through, and despite it being a mandatory creation by the suits and the white lab coats that you must abide by, they take zero responsibility for the people that don't get in and are sashing with crushing debt. They take zero responsibility for the people that are fired during their residency. If you don't make it and are left jobless and penniless and indebted the rest of your life, that is simply not their concern. It means the human being's life and career are less important than the cover sheet on a TPS report or the feeling of self-importance that they get. 
These educators will try to tell you that it's a matter of patient safety and public health that they had to fire someone, but it's not. It's a matter of their grift, their egos, and their lack of devotion to their charges. Barring criminal behavior and barring new and severe mental or physical disability, there should be no other reason to fire someone in the last stages of their 11 to 17 year training. Incompetence and inability could already have been, should already have been selected out through the first eight years of training in undergrad and medical school. But these dirty bastards don't care. They take no responsibility for, quote, education, end quote. Residency programs are extremely poor at teaching. They simply staff the hospital with underexperienced resident physicians and expect them to learn on the job from their own initiative, with their own money, and in their own free time if there ever is any. And during this entire process, you get treated like a child, talked down to when going from test to test, shut off from the world in study halls, writing exorbitant checks all the while to all of the grifters and leeches in the medical establishment, and then they are somehow shocked when not everyone meets their standards of maturity and professionalism immediately and on day one. Professionalism and the ethic of duty take time and a commission of gradually increasing responsibilities to foster and grow. It is not instantaneous and is not instilled by endless, expensive, multiple-choice tests and stacks and stacks of books. To be clear, I am not casting shade on my training or on my program. I believe they were nicer to me than I had any right to expect, and I am grateful to them for that. But the system is bad no matter where you are. It is unfair and it is cruel. At the time of this writing, I finished the last of my training six years ago, but I am still angry, still outraged, and still traumatized by how we were treated and how especially some of my colleagues were unceremoniously dismissed forever from medicine with no job prospects and no future after dedicating their lives to it. There is no guarantee for your success, even at the last and final stretch of your training. Even during that last full measure of devotion, even after four years of college, even after four years of medical school, and even after at least three years of mandatory postgraduate training, you can still be fired, you can still be drummed out into a world with no job prospects, with hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt, even after devoting at least a min minimum of 11 years of your life to medical training with long hours of rigorous study and painful and expensive evaluations. Most doctors give up the entirety of their 20s for this training. Most female doctors unwillingly give up the number of children they may have wanted. Some give up having children at all, finding out too late that their peak fertility has gone with their 20s. Some would-be physicians are rewarded with a swift kick in the ass out into a cold and uncaring world. So the question becomes, was it worth it? Was the juice worth the squeeze at the end of the day? For we lucky ones that got to finish, the answer is yes, but just barely. The system is broken. Tear it down. Create a system where aspiring doctors are not slaves to capricious and cruel grifters and overlords who can destroy their lives at a whim 